Hello, my wonderful people. Now we, the Nation Voice, permit me to you this moment to welcome you all once again to our new desk. Today, you get this video when I found. I just found this video newly, although this video don't say small. Now, speech from Femi Fanny Kayode. When I found this video, honestly, when I listened to this very video a lot day, when it be say I really learned, and this very video, it touched me. That is why I carry and consider, make a constant share with you now as a family. Maybe majority of you don't still see this video before, or some of you never still see it because as I talked before, see, the video don't take, not be just new video like that. I beg, after you don't watch this video finish, make you not forget to see help us share this video so that majority of us will never still see this video, they will still see the opportunity to still listen to the message when it day inside. As you do so, God will continue to bless you. And your comment, make you not forget to help us still put the comment, how you feel concerning this video for the comment session. I beg, make you take a little time because this video a long small as you do so god will continue to bless you all in jesus mighty name amen now i bless the name of the lord today i exalt him i praise him i honor him i worship him and i thank him for this gathering i thank eddie for inviting me to say a few words here and i exalt his name you see it is in him and him alone that we have power he gives it and he takes it. He gives us life. He gives us strength. In all things and in all ways, his name is exalted. He's a God of truth. He's a God of strength. With him there is no fear. With him there is no trepidation. Because he's a God that never fails his own. I come to you today to speak truth. I didn't come here to play politics because the situation we're in in this country requires truth requires people that will say it as it is and that will signal the dangers that lie ahead if we refuse to stand on that truth and it is a great privilege and honor for me to be speaking that truth before the sons and daughters of the Anago the sons and daughters of Odudwa, the pillar of this country, the pride and strength of Africa. That is what you are, regardless of party affiliation, regardless of what you believe in or what you don't believe in, that is what we are. And this is the most difficult gathering to speak before because, you know, they are very educated, sophisticated. We a very educated, sophisticated people. So, forgive me if I'm a little bit nervous, but I will do my best to speak truth, to say it as it is, and let's hope and pray that I'll be invited to come back again. <laughs> Regardless of what I may say here today. <laughs> Indeed, we thank God. Now, let's look at the situation in the country. And let's really look at it. Let's analyze what is really happening in Nigeria today under this government. And it really is a very, very sad story. It is gloomy. It is one that would cause most people to despair. But because we have a God that is mighty, we cannot despair. But we must at least look at the facts so that we know what to tell our people. And we know where we're heading if things don't change. First of all, the IMF has said that Nigeria is now the world's capital for poverty. That's what we are. Under the PDP government of President Goodluck Jonathan, ours was the fastest growing economy on the African continent. Today, under Buhari, we are the world's capital for poverty. Just yesterday, the World Bank made their own contribution and said that if things don't change and there's no reform in Nigeria, that 25% of the world's poor people will end up living in Nigeria and being Nigerians. 25%. A quarter of the world's poorest people, one quarter, will be living in Nigeria. 
if things don't change and there's no reform. They also said, and I'm quoting them, that dangerous poverty is coming to Nigeria. That's the World Bank. It's not the PDP, it's not a political party, it's not any of our revered leaders seated here today or the party, PDP party chairman or any of our governors or even our don, uh, presidential candidate. It is the IMF and it is the World Bank that are saying these things. And they really are worrying. But, you know, it's one thing to think about the economy and what lies ahead. And that is a big challenge. But perhaps the one that depresses most and gives cause for the greatest concern are the contradictions within Nigeria itself, quite apart from the poverty and what is coming and the bad way in which this government is running the economy. Let's look at the situation. This is a multilateral, multiracial, multicultural and multi-religious country. It is a country that we have always thrived on our various distinct tribes, ethnicity, religion, We've thrived on it, we've built on it, we've worked together. So I was saying that there is a more fundamental issue that we have to look at and we have to consider. It's a very serious issue indeed. One that transcends party politics, one that should attract the attention and the concern of every single Nigerian. And I, like I was saying, this country is a multi-religious, multi-ethnic, multicultural society. We've always based our strength on that. And we've loved one another, worked together, and moved forward. A few hiccups here and there. But we've managed ourselves, and we've worked together as one people. And the reason why that has been so is because there's a fundamental principle which none of us has ever dreamt of violating. And that is the principle of equality of tribe, equality of faith and equality of individuals that we're all equal before god and as long as you're a nigerian whether you were born in kafanchan daura lagos abia or wherever you had the opportunity to become somebody to lead the country to rise up and to ensure we thrived we we, we celebrated our variety we celebrated the fact that there were so many people, you, you know, our diversity was our strength. But you see, there's one problem with that. And the problem with that is this. When you get a man that manages to capture power one way or the other at the center and becomes president of the Federal Republic, an extremely powerful position, probably the most powerful president on the planet Earth, with few checks and balances, when you have a man like that, who is leading your nation, a massive, multicultural, multi-religious nation like this, then you have a problem. Because you see, his mindset is different to yours or ours. His mindset is different to Baba Basojo's. His mindset is different to virtually every single person that occupied that office before. Now his mindset is clear. And I won't, I won't, I'm not going to venture my opinion I'll simply give you a few facts and let you make your own deductions. That's what I'm going to say here. I'll come to the opinion later. Let's start with this. Let's look at the executive. Today in the executive of Nigeria, this APC government, what have they done? You have as president a northern Muslim. You have in all our security agencies as heads of them, 17 of them, northern Muslims, except for one, and that is the neighbor. You have a situation whereby, in today's villa, in the presidency, 90% of the people that are working there are northern Muslims. You have a situation whereby the lingua franca in the villa is Hausa. I worked there under Obasanjo, and so did Okupe, and so did so many other people. People like Kazari, they were all in government before, at the federal level. And they will tell you, we will tell you, that we never violated that principle of participation at the villa. Because the villa was for everybody. No matter what faith you are, no matter where you come from, that was the practice, that was the legacy that Obasanjo left. That was the legacy of Yaradua. That was the legacy of Good Luck Jonathan. But it's very, very different now. 90% of the people that work there are Northern Muslims and the lingua franca of our villa is Hausa. 
Now, before I leave the issue of security agencies, look at the recent example of what happened just a few days ago. We kept saying this, that it's not right to have only Northern Muslims heading every single principal security agency in the country except for one. But they didn't listen to us. What did they do just three, four days ago? They promoted and appointed another set of commissioners of police. Instead of learning from their mistakes, they built on them. They now ensured that the Northwest and the Northeast together had 20. I think Northwest was 10. Um, I'm not sure what the figures, but between the two of them, Northwest and Northeast had 20. The other zones, the other four zones, did not have up to 20 between all of them. Between four zones, yet two shared 20. And of course, the Southeast were only given one. I believe the Southwest had five. But together, we, only, we didn't have up to 20. But those two zones had 20. It's nothing new. It's something that we should have learned to live with by now. But it's good to keep reminding ourselves of how it shouldn't be and how it should be. Before I leave the executive, let me say one more thing. Look at the issue of substantive ministers, substantive ministries. Who heads them? You look at it, and I challenge you to go and cross-check this. I'm not talking about junior ministers or ministers of state. I'm talking about substantive ministers. You will find that when, when uh, Buhari came in this time round, he gave his own Northwest ten substantive ministers. He gave the Southwest five, which is half, and he gave all the other zones three each. What this means is this, that the Northwest has more than all the other zones other than the Southwest put together, and of course the Northwest has double what the Southwest has. The Northwest has virtually everything. Again, this could not have happened under Obasanjo. It couldn't have, couldn't have happened under Yaragua. It couldn't have happened under Good Luck Jonathan. Let me leave the executive and let me go to the legislature. But before I do that, let me give you one more fact. And please bear with me because these details are important. Please bear with me. If you go to NMPC, which is the goose that lays the golden egg in this country, the GMD, the minister, the substantive minister, who is the president himself, the GMD of NMPC, and every single key manager, every single one in NMPC today, is a Northern Muslim. You don't have anybody from outside the core north that has any key positions. I'm talking about sensitive and key directors in NMPC today. That is the executive end. And of course, I don't need to talk about INEC. I don't need to talk about so many national population. There's so many. Everything is there. Yet, we've somehow managed to live with it, manage it, and say, well, as long as they run the country properly, we can live with that because in four years' time, he'll be gone. But it's much more serious than that. And I'm sad, it's not sad to say it's not as simple as that. Let's look at the legislature very briefly. The legislature today in Nigeria. The Senate President is a Northern Muslim. The Speaker of the House, good friend of mine, good man. I've known him for over 40 years. Very, very good man. He is from the Southwest. But in terms of religion, he had to do a little bit of tinkling before he could get that position. And we all know this. I've known Femi for over 45 years. And that's his prerogative. I don't indict him for it. I don't condemn him for it. It's a, it's religion is a personal issue. But the fact that to enjoy a political office in this country, we now have resorted to the point that you have to somehow change your religion in order to be accepted by some people, is unacceptable. That's not the Nigeria we know. That's not the Nigeria that PDP built up over the last 16 years before we left power. And this is what is the situation. So, and of course, they haven't left it like that. If you look at it, all those around him, that is, the principal officers in the House of Reps, they are all Northern Muslims. Every single one of them. So they put a ring around him just in case he misbehaves. They get him out, they put somebody else there from the North. Let's look at the judiciary. Today, Nigeria's judiciary. The Supreme Court, headed by a Northern Muslim. The Court of Appeal, headed by a Northern Muslim. The Federal High Court, up until a few months ago, I think about three or four months ago, headed by another Northern Muslim. Now they have a Northern Christian there. And of course, understandably, he's having all kinds, I'm sure he may be having all kinds of challenges. 
But he's a northerner. There is no southerner there. There is nobody from the south there. And that is a reality that we have to live with. Go to the fourth estate of the realm, the media, who are here today. You know, I've been close to the media for many, many years. Many years. And I'll tell you this much. The repression, the threats, the intimidation, the publishers of newspapers, television stations, owners, and so on, get from the executive today is unprecedented. And they've told them categorically, you must black certain people out, you must not report events as they are, you must play everything down. That is what has happened under this government. We all know that for democracy, you must have what they call separation of powers. The executive, the judiciary, and the National Assembly. The latter two check as a sort of, they're a check on the exercise of the executive. But when one man, through his own kith and kin, and in the name of his faith, manages to control all of these branches of government, then you know we are in a dictatorship, and you know that anything is possible. And that's precisely where we are today, sadly. Let me move on. I don't need to say too much about the violation of court orders. Many of our leaders are still in detention. Dasuki has been there for how many years now? So many people are being locked up. Courts will say release them, they will say no. I was locked up for three months. At some point I was put in a Boko Haram cell. This is an experience that I would not want anybody to have. There's a special facility they built for Boko Haram prisoners in the Kujie prison. That's where I was put. But that's a story for another day. So many other people are suffering this indignity today, particularly opposition leaders, human rights abuses, so on and so forth. But perhaps the most disturbing thing, and you know, I'm, I'm sorry to have to go so deep, but this is a distinguished gathering of people that um, I have so much respect for. And I think that respect can only, you know, we have to speak truth. All these abuses. But let me tell you something that happened just yesterday. Perhaps I won't be so specific, but let me be very brief. I went to see a friend of mine who buried his brother uh, last week in Anambra State. His name is Ifai Yojiofo. He's a lawyer. He's Nandi Kano's lawyer. Good friend of mine and one of my own lawyers. I went there. I was there on Sunday. I went straight to the church to attend the Thanksgiving, uh, Thanksgiving service for the burial. I went to his home and I met the widow. I met the six children of the deceased. And I left there to get across to Lagos on, uh, on Sunday, late afternoon, from Asaba. At 6.30 a.m. the following morning, he called me panicking and shouting that his house had been raided by a combined team of mobile policemen, soldiers, and Air Force officers. And that they had killed four people. It's gone up to about nine now. They killed four people, shot them. One of the boys that escorted us from the traditional ruler's palace to his house was one of those killed. And not only that, they had burnt down his house, burnt down his late brother's house, burnt down the new house he was building across the road, burnt down all the properties in the area, burnt down the church in which we did Thanksgiving, traumatized the people, beaten people, raped children, beat up a, an old woman, the pastor of the church called me yesterday, eight year old was beaten up, brutalized, and so on and so forth. And the community was under occupation from 6.30 in the morning up until 6 in the evening. And the only reason they left was because so many interventions were made by essentially PDP governors. I have to say that because I know what happened. And we have to thank those that did that. People like Governor Gwai, Governor Mahi. So many PDP governors rose up and said, this is not acceptable. They, they called Abuja. They called, um, they called uh, the governor of uh, Anambra State himself and they were withdrawn at 6 o'clock. But the desolation, the burning, the raping, the pillaging, the trauma. And I ask myself, even if you say that after you attacked, in retaliation, after you killed four of them, they killed two policemen, which is terrible, reprehensible. We deplore violence. But even if you say that, how do you explain the fact that all the houses in the community, not just one, not two, not three, not four, all the houses... All the shops, all the commercial institutions in that community were leveled and burnt down in the space of one day. This is unacceptable. But that is what happens in Buhari's Nigeria. And we warned you, or rather we, 
That's PDP, warned them. We warned the Nigerian people that this would happen. And why am I shocked about what happened on the Inerifite on, in on Monday? I shouldn't be shocked. I remember what has been happening for the last four or five, for the last four years to IPOP youth, slaughtering them every day, somebody's child, killing them like flies, because they have said they want to exercise, they want to have a referendum, and perhaps exercise the right of self-determination. Slaughtered them. That blood speaks, or is it the Shiite Muslims who have been slaughtered by flies, whose leader was shot in the eye, whose children were killed, whose wife was shot four times in the stomach, and who has remained in detention ever since, despite court orders? Or is it those of us in Oprah land that have been slaughtered morning, night, and day? Yes, today you will hear it. What people don't want to hear, what the world doesn't want, what they don't want the world to know. you hear it today. Go to the forests of the southwest, and I'm coming to the southwest in a moment, and see who is there now. Checkpoints on our roads, manned by officers of what they describe as Mieti Allah. At least that's what the identity card said. We saw the videos. How do you explain this? Our own people being killed. The daughter of our leader in Afeni Fere, slaughtered in the southwest by the usual suspects. Go to the middle belt. Southern Kaduna, Shameful. Christmas 2016. Christmas Day and Christmas Eve. 800 innocent women and children were slaughtered by Fulani herdsmen in two days. Nobody was brought to book. Nobody was caught. Go to Taraba, Adamawa. Go to every part of the, of, of the Middle Belt and parts of the border. Go to Katsina and see what they are doing there to the local Hausa population. This started and has been sustained and it's been encouraged by this man that is in the villa today who does not see fit to disarm these people, many of whom are not even Nigerians, but they have come here to come and slaughter our people. That is what you get when you put a man like that in power. He is somebody that has been a plague to our people. A very present threat to the existence of a united Nigeria. Someone that doesn't even represent the Fulani. He represents only himself and the tendency within the Fulani, Fulani ruling class who believe that they are masters of a born to rule and who believe they must subjugate the rest of Nigeria. And he's affecting that agenda very, very effectively. Permit me to continue. And I, 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 I will say some more very harsh things today. Forgive me. President Lucia Waba Sojo, one of the most revered leaders in the world, indeed in world history, a father, a friend, and a great mentor. Somebody that has staked his life, and Kazari can confirm this, because I know how closely they work together. You know, in those days we all worked together. It doesn't, didn't matter where you were from. It didn't matter what your faith was. But he always believed in a united Nigeria, and if you go to him, and you start talking about ethnicity or religion, he will throw you out. In fact, to an extent that many people from the Southwest didn't like him for that. Say, you're one of us, why? You don't say, no, 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 I'm interested only in Nigeria. Now, for him to come out about just a year or so ago, six months ago, to send a signal warning to the world and to this government and say that there is a fulanization and an Islamization agenda that is being orchestrated by President Buhari and his government. And that the danger of that is that we may end up in catastrophe. Warning that you can only push people up to a certain extent. If people feel that they cannot be freed through participatory democracy and going to an election and winning a free and fair election, if people feel they're being rigged out, they're being killed, they're being brutalized, they're being enslaved, they're being Islamized, they're being fulanized, or whatever you like to call it. He was saying that the reaction would be a very terrible one inevitably. He didn't pray for that. He simply said that's the reality. And he cited Yugoslavia and other parts of the world where Lebanon and so many where such things had happened and it had ended up in civil strife, civil wars and so on and so forth. My prayer is that we never ever see such a thing again. But the elder statesmen have spoken and yet, what did this government do? Absolutely nothing. They dug deep and continued their agenda. 
We spoke about the evil of the Fulani herdsmen. That is self-evidence. I don't need to talk about that anymore. I will also tell you this though. There is another evil, which is of course Boko Haram, the most deadly terrorist organization in the world according to the International Terror Index, and of course the Fulani militants, they call them, are the fourth according to the International Terror Index. Now what have they done with Boko Haram? They have released more Boko Haram prisoners than any government that came before them. They have reintegrated Boko Haram fighters into the Nigerian army. A commander in the military got up the other day, the army got up the other day and said, addressing them, that even if you are Boko Haram yesterday, as long as you renounce violence, you may end up, you can, you can come back into civil society and end up being president of Nigeria. Imagine that. Imagine that. A serving commander in the military said that. But why wouldn't he say so? Because the CNC has absolutely no objection to that. Indeed, if you look at what he has said over the years, you'll be quite shocked. You know, it's important to collate, to read, to remember, and to fight these people with truth and facts and what they've said in the past. Before I go to the past, let me go to the present. When they wanted to bring Ruga, and everybody was saying, we will not give up our land, because what the practice is to send people in, they go in there, kill everybody, occupy it, live there, and then change the name of the community, which was happening in Plateau State. That's what they were doing. And people said, we won't give up our land. We will stand and we will fight and protect our land. That's all we have. And what did the presidency say? Femi Adeshino, a son of the Southwest, spokesman of the President of the Federal Republic, got up and said, you, make, you have to make a choice. It's either you give up your land and accept Ruga, or you give up your life. Think of the profundity and the seriousness and the implications of that statement. You must give up your land to the Fulani herdsmen. And if you don't, they're going to kill you and there's nothing your government can do about it. That is very, very sad. And let's go to the past. This same president of ours came to the southwest, went to see Lamadishino, Governor Lamadishino, many years ago, 2001. There had been a conflict between Yorubans and Fulani. And he said to them there, he said to Lamadishino, in public glare, he said, why are your Yoruba people killing my Fulani people? That's the president you have today. This same president said in 2001 that it is his desire to spread Sharia all over the Federation. This same president said in 2001 that it, he believes that every Muslim in this country should vote only for Muslims. This man said in 2013 that he believes that the prescription of Boko Haram was a big mistake and was wrong. And then an attack on Boko Haram is an attack on the north. This is the man that said we should pamper the Fulani herdsmen and accept them as being part of us. And of course his vice president said, another wonderful son of the southwest, said when the Fulani herdsmen come to kill you and your family, don't indulge in self-defense and don't resist them. Rather, get down on your knees and pray for them. These things are on record. I challenge you to go and cross-check these things that I have claimed that they have said and determine it for yourself. It's veracity for yourself.